My name is Katherine Rodella. I'm the program manager for the Master of Healthcare Innovation. Uh, so I'm involved with a lot of the day-to-day -day administrative side of the program, and I'm usually the first point of contact for applicants and for current students, and I'll be leading most of the presentation today. Um, also on the call with me is my colleague Adam Zolkover. Adam, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Adam. I'm one of the instructional designers in the program. I work with faculty to uh, help classes come together. Thanks. Uh, today we're going to be doing sort of a broad overview of the program. We'll talk about the general structure of the program, what it's like learning online since it is a bit different than your typical in-person master's program. Uh, we'll go over how the on-campus part of the degree works. We'll talk a bit about um, details of the capstone project, tuition, uh, review the admissions process and what's required for that. And then I know a lot of you are also interested in the certificate programs we offer and how those fit into the master's program. So we'll talk about that briefly at the end. Um, as we're going through the presentation, feel free to ask questions. Like Adam mentioned before, uh, please do that through the chat function, which is on the right side of your blue jeans screen. There are a lot of people on the call, so that'll help it move along a little more smoothly. Um, and once you type something in there, Adam or, or somebody on our team will be able to read it out loud. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go, but there will be a dedicated time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. The overarching mission of the Master of Healthcare Innovation is to address the rapidly changing healthcare landscape by advancing innovation among healthcare professionals. Um, and all of the curriculum and, and coursework is geared towards driving towards that goal. Um, the program is very interdisciplinary, the, and you can see here the four main areas of focus. They are health policy, which is headed up by our faculty director, Zeke Emanuel, behavioral economics, which is taught by Kevin Volpe, operations management, which is led by Christian Turvich from the Wharton School of Business, and innovation methodologies. Um, it's also important to note that it's not just the curriculum that's interdisciplinary. Our faculty also are very interdisciplinary. Um, they primarily come from the Perlman School of Medicine, which is where the degree is uh, administered, but they also come from the Wharton School of Business, the Law School, Penn Nursing, um, and the Penn Medicine Center for Healthcare Innovation. There are a few specific ways that the program um, tries to address this mission. Firstly, that's through building a network of healthcare innovators and resources, um, through giving students practical tools for designing systemic solutions to problems that they face in healthcare delivery, and finally, by having students apply those concepts in practice to a student-directed capstone project. So what kind of students do we get in the program? Um, it's a very new program. Our first cohort is currently taking classes now. They just started this fall. There are 18 of them from many different areas of healthcare, and they come from all over the country. Um, they're a mix of both clinicians and non-clinicians. So on the clinician side, we have some physicians from different backgrounds, um, health systems, academic medical centers, private practice, and we also have nurses. And then on the non-clinical side, it's a mix of mostly administrators and researchers. Um, but like I said, this is the very first class of the program, so they're definitely not the exhaustive list of the kinds of backgrounds that students um, in this program could have. So some other backgrounds that we think that um, might benefit from doing a program like this are students from um, insurance companies, from government agencies, uh, dental medicine, and, and probably lots of other uh, sectors of healthcare. The current students have an average of about 14 years uh, working professionally in healthcare, but it's a big range from uh, about three years of experience to over 30 plus years of experience. And this slide is a nice uh, comprehensive look at the structure of the program and how it works over the entire 18 months. The very first thing that you do as a student is you come to campus here in Philadelphia for our on, what we call our on-campus seminar. Uh, the one for this year is scheduled for August 18 through 22. And a little bit later in the presentation, we'll talk more about the details of that. 
but it's four and a half days on campus. And then after that, in early September is when you start your online coursework. So through the first year of the program, primarily what you're doing is taking your core courses. Now these are all online and they're taken one at a time. Um, they're usually six weeks long, but a couple of them do have a lab component, so they last eight weeks to, to account for that. Uh, towards the end of your first semester in December is when you'll start planning your capstone project. So this is, over these five months is when you're laying the foundation for, for carrying out your capstone while you're taking your core courses. You'll be paired up with a faculty advisor to help you through this. And what you're doing in this phase is uh, a number of things. You might be conducting a literature review or starting your research. You might be talking to stakeholders to get buy-in um, and just laying all the, all the foundation that you'll need to be able to actually carry the project out. And then finally, towards the end of that first year in June and July, during the capstone review phase, is when you put together your concrete uh, capstone plan that has actual milestones and, de and deadlines. There's a, a little bit of a break over the summer, about a month off, and then you come back to kick off your second year with another on-campus session for, for four and a half days. And then for the final six months of the program, you're, you're really doing two things simultaneously. First, you're taking elective courses, which are a bit shorter than the core courses, but they're still taken one at a time, and there's a week off in between each one. And while you're doing that, you're spending the final six months on carrying out your capstone project. All of that wraps up in February of 2020 with a, a final report of the capstone project and a presentation to uh, your fellow students and faculty members. Um, any questions in the chat about the structure of the program? Yeah, Dustin asked, is the time flexible? In other words, can it be spread out over two or three years rather than 18 months? Also, what is the expected weekly time commitment during classes? Thanks. Um, the degree is designed to be a cohort experience, so it has to be done within that 18 months. Um, but it is designed for working healthcare professionals so there's a lot of flexibility built into the 18 months. We know that um, things come up at work, you could hit a busy time of the year, things happen in your personal lives. Um, so we're definitely prepared for that and can work with you to, um, to work around whatever might come up there. As far as coursework, when you're in an actual course, students usually spend around uh, 10 to 12 hours per week on the coursework. And asks, uh, what are the elective choices? Do you have an actual comprehensive list just yet? We do have a list. Um, I don't have a slide for it in this presentation, but it is on the website. Um, and I can uh, certainly send that to you afterwards. But if you go to the website under the curriculum page, you'll see a link for electives, and there's a list of them there with descriptions. Are the electives online or face-to-face? Yep, the electives are online too. Uh, the, only, the only things that are in person are the on-campus seminars each August, but the coursework itself is all done online. Jane asks, what is the weekly time commitment for online courses? It's usually about eight to, eight to 12, sorry, 10 to 12 hours a week of coursework. Okay, let's move on. Um, we wanted to share some tips and strategies for learning online since it is a little bit different than a typical, um, typical in-person program. Um, and so sometimes that unknown can be a little bit intimidating even though it, it really doesn't need to be. Uh, we will help you prepare for it and help you get used to it. Um, some of the most important things to remember is that you should really make sure you're clear on expectations before you begin. Um, soon Adam will take you through a, a walkthrough of an actual course site and you'll see that you can look at the course before it begins and make sure you know what all the assignments are and what will be expected of you. Just like in any normal course, you want to take notes as you're watching lecture videos and read mat reading materials. Make sure you take breaks so that you can absorb information and you don't get overloaded. And maybe the, one of the most important things in online learning is to uh, communicate. Keep in touch with the TAs, keep in touch with the faculty, um, participate in discussion forums with your, with your fellow students, and you'll find your learning outcomes are a lot better 
Um, you know, since you're learn learning remotely, a lot of those connections don't happen organically, walking down the hallway or running into somebody. So you really want to make sure you're, you're putting in that effort in the online course, and you'll get a lot more out of it. And finally, you'll need to be a lot more mindful of your own time management, which again we said would be about 10 to 12 hours a week while you're in a course. There is a lot of support available. So even though you might be learning remotely, you're not just out there on your own trying to figure it out. We'll do some technology orientation at the on-campus seminar before you even start your coursework. There's a community site that you can always refer back to that has tips and tutorials about how to navigate the courses and how to learn online effectively. Um, there are TAs in every course that are there to help you with uh, coursework and course content, questions about assignments. There's administrative support from myself and the rest of the staff. And there's also always technical support available. Uh, we have our own in-house help email, and there's also help available through Canvas, which is the, the system where the, um, the learning management system where the courses take place. OK, and I'm going to hand it over to Adam now to tell you a bit about what the course experience is like and to show you what a, what a course looks like. Yeah, so I just wanted to take you briefly through uh, a little bit of the principles of how we how we organize our courses, and then I'm going to show you one of the courses. So the main thing is to, to consider, once again, it's about 10 to 12 hours a week while you're in a course, and that is broken into content slash media time. So that would be lectures. We have um, uh, well-produced, clear lectures from top faculty. Uh, we have uh, readings for, for, for the courses, obviously. The second pillar of that is interactions. Those interactions include uh, discussions where you guys are going to get to talk to each other about the content and also interactions with faculty. Uh, up until this point, many of our, uh, our interactions with faculty have included web synchronous sessions every week. So that is um, uh, video conferences using this platform, BlueJeans. Uh, they're scheduled uh, five times during six weeks or sometimes six times during six weeks, and they're also recorded for people who can't make those times. Uh, there are other uh, interactivity solutions that we also use that require a little bit less scheduling sometimes, and uh, those can, can add to the flexibility of the courses. The last pillar is assessments. Uh, this is for helping you figure out how much you've learned in the class and uh, helping us figure out how much you're learning in the class. So those are broken down. Most classes have weekly quizzes. They have uh, practical assignments that are uh, career and workplace driven and that are uh, meant to be immediately useful for you. And then um, there's also usually a final assignment, which is oftentimes a project that's meant to help you think through the concepts in the course and figure out how to apply those both to your work and to your thinking about your capstone project. So I'm going to steal the screen from Catherine now. You'll just uh, you'll you'll have to give me a minute here and uh, show you what is going on in there we go uh, one of our courses. So. You can see uh, one of our courses here. It is Evaluating Health Policy and Programs with uh, Dr. Navate, and I'm going to make this a little bit larger for you, so hopefully you can see it a little bit better. Um, this class, Evaluating Health Policy and Programs, you can see here the front page. It includes a course overview. It includes uh, learning outcomes, so things that uh, we think that you'll get out of the class. Uh, it also includes key dates on the front page. You can see that there is a fair amount of stuff to do every week, but not actually that much stuff to do every week. A large portion of what you're doing is relatively self-paced. You can do it at night, on weekends, on your own time, and all of our due dates are at the very ends of weeks to add to that flexibility. And then um, the last thing that I'm going to show you down at the bottom is this big red Start Here button. And so I'm going to click on the Start Here button, and uh, you'll see what the course really looks like on the inside. Uh, first, I wanted to point out that there's a lot of help available right at the beginning. There's an introduction to Canvas, so it's a very, very brief video that you can look at to show you how to use the learning environment. Uh, there's links to resources at Penn's library. and then. What you see here are the lectures for week one of the class, and I'm just going to click on one of them. I'm not going to play it for you because it's not going to play well over blue jeans. But you can see how this how this looks. I just sort of picked one at random here. 
Uh, this one is what is evaluation and you can see that most pages have a video it is seven to ten minutes long and it comes with all the accoutrements like closed captions and transcripts uh, the last thing that all that, that i wanted to point out to you is that on every lecture page there are supplementary materials that are geared toward helping you learn and remember stuff from the lectures and take that out into the world with you when 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 you go to use this in, in, in real life. There was one thing that I had wanted to talk about because Bill had asked me to. Uh, Bill had asked in the, in, in the chat, what are the labs? And I wanted to address that here because I think that this is, this is the most important uh, or the most useful place to do that. The labs are uh, short four week additional classes that are meant to supplement two of the classes in the program. So that would be healthcare operations and um, behavioral economics. And what those are, are essentially practicums. They're taking, con uh, they're taking content from the courses and guiding you through a project where you have to apply that content to a real world setting. So they're not labs in the sense of it's a place where you go that has equipment. They're labs in the sense of you're taking ideas that you've learned in the class and doing something with them in a structured way. So that's what I got. Uh, sorry again about the crash. That's all right. Thanks a lot, Adam. Uh, we do have some questions though, it looks like. Shall I ask you? Sure. All right. So people are asking, um, uh, what is the grading scale for these classes? Uh, the grading scale is uh, every class is on a scale of of of, of 100 points, and it's it's graded like like most uh, academic programs. So that is to say, um, on an A to F scale. Uh, the time commitment is 10 to 12 hours a week for uh, our classes. If possible, would you let us see the screen that we will see in the lecture? Um, I am going to go back to sharing that right now so that you can see it. This is what you'll see during the lecture. I can't play the video over blue jeans. I don't think that it will I don't think that it will work very well, but you can see here that there is the video window and then there's also the supplementary resources. Um, and finally, is the capstone congruent to a master's thesis? And that is a Catherine question. I would say yes, it is. Um, the The major difference is that it's not so much a research project, it is a um, practical applied project. It could be something that you are doing at work. Um, it could be, you know, a piece of a larger long-term project that you're doing. But yeah, I would equate it to a master's thesis. Somebody asks, as a physician, why would one choose this program over a healthcare MBA that some institutions offer? Where do students enrolling in this hope to take their career? Also, is this presentation online so that I can show it to my spouse? Those are great questions. Those are great questions and questions that we do get a lot. Um, the Master of Healthcare Innovation is a lot about contextualizing your role in the larger healthcare system. Um, I think that piece of it is a bit different than what you would get in a healthcare MBA. Um, the MHCI is, is really looking at how can we improve, improve the experience of patients, of doctors, payers, all, all of the different players in the healthcare system. Um, whereas an MBA might be a little more broadly applied and not quite as specific to those areas. Um, the presentation, we will send a link of the recording out to everybody after the session. So. Um, probably will go out tomorrow and then you can share that link with your spouse. Um, and Bill, I'm sorry, what was the last question? Uh, that was the last question. Oh, okay, but Bill good. asks, can you share some ideas about what capstones the current cohort is planning, especially examples of where the cohort is leveraging their current work? Sure, um, I have a list of some of their topics. Uh, they don't have their exact titles formed yet. Um, one of our physicians is looking at using nudging interventions to promote the use of CPAP. Um, another one is looking at um, relieving bottlenecks in patient flow as they move from admission to a neural critical care unit. Um, one of our non-physician researchers wants to look at uh, uh, implementing a, a behavioral intervention to reduce low value care and instead nudge providers towards prescribing high value oncology drugs. Um, so some of those are um, overlapping with, say, projects that they've been tasked to look at at work, and some of them are 
brand new that they're starting just for the master's program. Um, and we do have a slide on the capstone a little bit later, so um, we will talk a little bit more in detail about how all of that will work and how it's broken up. All right, awesome. Um, as I was saying before, we have a couple of our current students who were generous enough with their time to, to get on the call today. Uh, we have Kim Woodruff, who was able to get out of jury duty just in time <laughs> to join us today. Um, Kim, could you introduce yourself and maybe briefly say what you do and talk a little bit about how, uh, how you balance schoolwork with your career and what your experience in the program has been? Sure, absolutely. And yes, I got out of the box just in time to make this. So it was a bit of a crazy day for me. But hi, everyone. Um, you can hear me okay, right, before I start going on too much? Yeah, I can hear you great. Okay, great. Okay. So um, I, my name is Kim Woodruff. I'm a research director at Janssen Pharmaceuticals. I work in the immunology business um, for this cohort, I'm the token industry colleague. Um, I think everyone else works in clinical practice or in a research um, lab outside of industry. I bring a bit of a different context to the experience than some of my classmates. Really so um, the program, as Adam and Catherine have talked about, it really is flexible and designed for working professionals. I've found it to be, um, relatively easy to incorporate into my daily life. We all um, have families of our own and other obligations outside of, you know, quite the demanding job for many of us that um, given its flexibility, it's still doable as long as you are efficient with your time. So the way the lectures are um, broadcasted for us, they're in smaller time crunches. So even if you have a 15 minute break, you can watch a portion of that week's lectures and get something done here and there throughout the course of your day, night, weekend, what have you. So it is very flexible. Um, it's been a rare occasion, at least for me personally, where I felt like it was hard to keep up. That was, I think we're on our fourth class now and I've felt the experience has been, because of its flexibility, it has been very doable um, to incorporate into my job and everything else that we try to get done in a day. So I think I'll stop there for now, um, and I'm just gonna turn it over to Mitch or have any questions before I, um, I guess, go any further. That's great. Thanks, Kim. Sure. Um, we do also have uh, another student, Vrush, who is nice enough to um, agree to do this right at the last minute. So I'm sorry, Vrush, I don't have your photo and information up there, but um, if you could introduce yourself and, and briefly explain what you do and, and tell us about your experience in the program. That would be great. Sure. Um, hey guys, I'm Rish Ladaj. I work with Dr. Jaffa Doshi here at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, our work is academic. It's, in some sense, it mirrors what Kimberly does at Janssen. It's health outcomes economic research, um, focusing on pharmaceuticals. Um, so, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. What was your question again? Yeah. Yeah, can you just tell us um, a bit about how you balance the, the program with work and if, you know, if there's anything else you want to share about the experience so far that you think would be helpful for applicants? Sure. So, um, you know, since I work in academia, my work um, uh, sort of fluctuates based on what time cycle we're at, we're at with our project. Um, I'm, uh, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a 20-something-year-old guy who does not have uh, a family or kids to think about other commitments aside from uh, you know, just work and, uh, you know, my free time. So it's relatively easier for me to deal with the program compared to someone like Kimberly or Mitch who have a lot of other commitments that they have to uh, juggle along with their schoolwork. But um, it's been it's smooth sailing for me. It's been entirely doable. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the scope and breadth of the things that you learn from the program, I think it's got a wide enough scope and enough things um, that interest me, not just um, from the experiences that I've had academically um, in, in health economics or health outcomes, but there's a lot of new things that I've learned that I wouldn't have otherwise, you know, if I was stuck in my job. So it's it's been a uh, fulfilling wide scope of things that I've learned from the program. Great, thanks a lot. Um, any any burning questions for Kim or Vrush before we move on? I don't know if it's for Kim or Vrush, but Dustin okay. asks, is there a structured mentorship component? It's not a mentorship component per se, but students are paired with an individual uh, faculty advisor for their capstone project. Um, it could be a faculty member who teaches in the program, or it could be a faculty member outside of the program, um, and they are matched with you based on whether they have relevant expertise in the area that your, your project is in. 
Um, so it's not a mentorship, but they will help guide you through the process of um, figuring out your topic and narrowing it down to, um, to an appropriate scope and, and giving advice along the way. Is that a question from someone? Yeah, one more question. Go DS ahead. asks, is there a career fair or something similar, like a career, uh, like career mentoring offered uh, by the program, like they do with Wharton students, uh, that looks to help students as they're finishing the program? Also, what kind of alumni network is available to students, given that the program is so new? Um, that's a very timely question. We are in the process of putting together a few different career services related um, resources and events. One thing that we're doing is we are uh, gathering some innovation um, leaders and employers around the area that we have connections to and we are recording interviews with them where they talk about what it is they do in their job, what path they took to get there, or if it's an employer, what they're looking for. Um, in in new employees and how you might find your way to um, an organization like theirs, we are um, we will also be putting together some uh, innovation career panels at the in person seminar. Um, we have a, a robust network of people from the Penn Medicine Center for Healthcare Innovation, and they'll come and talk about their work a bit. Um, as far as the alumni network, obviously we don't have any alumni yet. This is only the first year, but um, there is a plan to always have alumni come back and build that robust network to come back to seminars and talk about what they're up to um, to connect alumni with current students. But in the meantime, um, there is a lot going on with connecting students to our faculty members, to speakers, and to the wider network um, that, that Penn has. I would add uh, I would add one more thing if I could, yeah. uh, which is that our faculty work pretty closely with industry in creating these classes, and so uh, this program is on a lot of people's radars. Uh, Kim and Virch, thank you so much for uh, for being here and, and taking the time to talk to potential applicants. Um, let's move on to the on-campus seminar. Like I said, this will be the very first thing you do in the program as a student. You come to campus in August, you're here for four and a half days, and it's a pretty packed four and a half days with a lot of programming. Um, there are interactive workshops. For example, last year we had a really fun two-day workshop on negotiation skills. This year we're planning ones on leadership skills and public speaking skills. There are a lot of opportunities for networking and socializing, um, not only with your fellow students, but with the faculty members and with different industry speakers that will come. Um, and then in the first year, there are also some orientation sessions to get you um, to get you comfortable with the program. And like I said, a technology orientation so that you know what you're doing once you leave campus. And then in the, the second year, when you come back for your second on-campus seminar, there will be a lot of capstone advising sessions to help you with that. Um, oh, I should point out the, the seminar for this year is scheduled for August 18 through 22nd, so you might want to um, just hold that in your calendars. As far as logistics goes, uh, students are responsible for their travel to and from Philadelphia, but other than that, the program covers all of the seminar costs and will cover your lodging at a hotel on campus and will cover the costs of of all the programming throughout, throughout the week, including meals. That brings us to the capstone project, which I know is something that um, a lot of people have questions about and are curious about how it works. In your application, you'll be asked to send in a one-page tentative capstone topic. Um, and now that topic, you're not locked into that. You will have an opportunity to revise it later. But I want to encourage you in the application to be specific about, about the topic. Don't just say, oh, I want to do something in behavioral economics. Um, it's really much better if you state your actual research question. Um, give a little bit of background about why it's significant. And maybe talk about some of the methods that you might use to, to carry out your project. Um, it's only a page, so we're not expecting you to have a, a full complete project, project plan in place, but be specific enough that, that we know what you have in mind. The capstone project is broken up into three phases, and these are all credit-bearing phases. Um, the first phase starts in December towards the end of your first semester. This is a, a long, 
five-month phase where you're doing all the planning, which I mentioned a bit about before. So in this phase, you are um, consulting with your advisor to really narrow down the topic and scope. Depending on what your project is, you might be conducting a literature review, or maybe you're starting conversations with stakeholders to get buy-in. Or if you need IRB approval, you might be starting that process. And then probably by the end of that capstone planning phase, you should really have your topic um, more confirmed and cemented. Because then in the, the capstone review phase in June and July, that's when you review all of your planning and you come up with an actual concrete project plan that has uh, milestones and deadlines and metrics for success. And then, as I mentioned, over the last six months of the program in year two, that's when you're actually carrying out your capstone project. So you're um, running your behavioral intervention or you're collecting your data and analyzing it, whatever it may be. Um, and you will, as I said, have that faculty advisor to, um, to guide you and to bounce questions off of and do some troubleshooting with. You'll also be paired with a research librarian um, who could be another resource for you and will have um, expertise in a related area. And finally, all of the capstone wraps up in February with a final report and a presentation to your classmates and faculty members. So I want to jump in with a question from A. Sanon. Mm -hmm. He asks, how is this program different from well-established programs at Princeton and Berkeley and Columbia? Uh, so those are an MPP in health policy, an MPA slash MPP in health policy and management, and an MPA slash MPH. Uh, what is the end goal for current students? Early career education, career advancement, new job, mid-career change, or end-of-career educational pursuit? To um, address the first question a little bit, um, the MHCI is a bit different from, say, an MPA or a more traditional program like that, um, and that it's about trying to improve healthcare delivery. Um, it's very interdisciplinary. Um, an MPA obviously would be very policy focused, and there's definitely some policy in this program, but I would say this program is a bit more interdisciplinary in that it also brings in the uh, behavioral economics component and innovation methodologies. It's a very um, applied practitioner's degree. Um, and a major component of this, which is also part of the end goal for students, is to build a network of innovators and problem solvers. So at the end of this, you're going to have a new network of people who are just as committed to innovation and to improving healthcare that you can continue to collaborate with or rely on. Um, and you're also getting, um, you're getting the perspective of people with lots of different backgrounds from all around healthcare. Was there any, Adam, were you going to add something to that? Yeah, to address the second part of the question, so what is the end goal for current students? Uh, the answer is that there uh, are people in the program who are there for early career education, people who are there for career advancement, and people who are there for a mid-career change. All of those things are true. Um, we talked today with, 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 with somebody who is uh, young and up and coming, but there are also people who are well established in their careers who are looking for ways to improve their workplace and to improve the healthcare system that they work in, and who are also in it to look at broader policy questions beyond just where they are right now. Next up is tuition. Uh, students in this program are um, get charged tuition according to course unit or CU. Um, so to give you an example, a, a typical core course would be one CU, and then a course at the lab is one and a half CUs, an elective is a half CU. Um, so you can think of one CU as being equivalent to, say, a, a three-credit typical semester-long course. Um, over the, the 18 months of the program, you'll be taking 12 CUs total, and at this upcoming year's academic year's rates, one CU is $5,500. Um, so to give you uh, a long-term view of what that would mean, the projective, projected total cost for the first cohort is about $70,500. Um, a lot of people have questions about funding opportunities. Um, there's no, there are no scholarships from this program specifically since it is very new. Um, some students will get funding from their employers uh, some are self-funded, some choose to go the route of educational loans, 
So one important thing to keep in mind if you do choose to, to pursue that is that you need to be considered at least a part-time student in the semester that you're applying for the loan. And that will be the case in all of the semesters except for the last semester in spring 2020. You're not taking enough credits to be considered at least part-time. Um, and you do, you are also able to um, look at outside organizations for scholarships. I would encourage you to check with any professional associations that you're a member of um, and to do some research. There are a lot of, um, a lot of scholarships out there um, and you might search for something like uh, healthcare graduate scholarships or healthcare master scholarships. And um, innovation is a very specific topic, so you should broaden the search to include things like um, health policy or healthcare administration programs. DS asks, can Penn Med slash HUP faculty use tuition credits for this program? Yes, if you're a Penn employee, you can use your employee tuition benefits towards this program. So the, the final deadline for this year to start this fall is May 15th. It's going to be rolling admissions until then. So what that means is the admissions committee will start reviewing your application as soon as it's complete. They won't necessarily wait until May 15th to start looking at it. And you'll get an answer from us within four weeks of when your application is complete. To be eligible to apply, you do need to have a bachelor's degree and you should have at least three years of professional experience in healthcare. Um, the, the classes really are designed for someone who's currently working in the healthcare field. The application is online. You can find it at the link that's up here, in improvinghealthcare.net. Um, and all of the, the required components of it are listed there in more detail. But to go through them quickly, there's an online form to fill out. You'll be asked to upload a two to three page personal statement about why you're applying to the program and how it might fit into your professional goals. A current CV, um, you'll be asked to upload a one page tentative capstone topic that I had mentioned before, um, and two letters of recommendation. And just so you're aware, in the online form, you'll be asked to put in your recommender's contact information. And as soon as you put that information in, they'll get an automatic email asking them to upload a letter to the system. So you might want to get in touch with them ahead of time just to give them a heads up so that they, uh, they know to look out for the email and they know what it is once it gets to them. Um, finally, the last thing that's required for the, uh, the application are official transcripts from your previous schools, but those are sent separately from the online application. You can either mail those in a hard copy or um, they can be sent electronically, but either way they should be sent directly from the institution. Uh, there's no application fee and we don't require any standardized test scores to apply. Uh, a bit about how the admissions process will work. After you submit your application, the admissions committee will start looking at it. You might be invited to um, an online interview with me over blue jeans, just like this. And then finally, you will hear back with an answer within four weeks of applying. Uh, the last thing I wanted to make sure to talk about today were the certificate programs that we offer. I know a lot of you asked about them and were curious. Before, before, oh. before you go on, um, yep. A. Sanon asks, uh, is there an application fee? No, there's no application fee. And uh, you can find all of those required components are listed at the website um, on the admissions page on, at improvinghealthcare.net. And it lists in detail what exactly you need to do for each of those components. Um, so we do offer a professional development certificate in healthcare innovation. Um, now, just a heads up for any of you who are Penn people, there is also a separate track that's available to you that I'll talk about after this one. But the professional development certificate is open to any healthcare professionals inside or outside of Penn. And what's important about this certificate is that these are non-credit courses. And there are two really important implications of that. The first is that since they are non-academic, non-credit courses, they cannot be transferred into the master's program. Um, this certificate, even though it covers a lot of the same topics as the master's program, it's meant for healthcare professionals who want to get the skills and want to get the knowledge that they can apply immediately in work, in their work, 
but maybe they don't want the full commitment of an 18-month master's program or, you know, the, the time and money commitment of something like that. Um, the other important implication of the fact that it's non-credit is that it is significantly cheaper than a credit course. Um, so you can see at the bottom here, it's 1549, $1,549 per course. Um, if you commit to doing the four course certificate, you can pay in bulk and get a bit of a discount. So with this professional development certificate, it's four courses to earn the certificate, or you can take courses individually, just you know, according to your, your interest and, and your time availability. Um, so to review, what's important to remember, it's non-credit, cannot be applied to the masters. Um, it's meant to be a, a lighter load, but you still get that knowledge and, and skill set that you can apply immediately in your work. I would add to that that you also still get a lot of the same interactions, uh, not with the faculty quite as much, but with each other. It's also a great networking opportunity there. Yeah, that's a good point, thanks. Yeah, and we get, we get learners from all different areas of healthcare in this. Um, we've heard from a lot of them that that's been really valuable for them to get those connections. Finally, I know there are a lot of you on the call who are um, Penn employees. So you also have this additional option, which is the Penn Affiliate Academic Track. Um, this track is only open to people who are current Penn faculty, uh, Penn staff, or uh, students who are currently enrolled in Penn professional and graduate programs. And the major difference with this track is that these are uh, full credit academic graduate level courses. So these courses can be transferred into the master's program. Um, it is just as time intensive and academically rigorous as the master's courses, so it is a, a, a bit more of a commitment than the professional development courses, and the tuition rate is the same as the master's courses. Um, with this one, you also can take courses individually, or if you want to earn the full certificate, you can take four courses within two years. Well, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, we can open up this time now for, for questions about anything. Um, I just want to remind you again that the deadline application is May 15th, and I know it's close to 5 o'clock, so if anyone does need to go, we will be sending you a, a recording of the session afterwards. Bill and Jane both ask, uh, for current students, why did you choose uh, this over the MPH, MPP, MBA, uh, or MHA? If this is Kim, I can, I can jump in there. So um, I think at least from the industry perspective, an MBA um, would probably be more relevant if I were more in the commercial marketing track, which I'm not, I'm in the research track. And the courses all offered in this program including the electives, I wanted to take every one of them. The, everything this, this program offers, I thought was very beneficial and valuable to me and what I do now. Um, MBA, it was um, not, the curriculum and, and the course requirements just didn't really align to my career goals at this time. So just really personal preference more than anything. Mark asks, uh, if you've done an MHA at an equal caliber university, would this be a lot of educational overlap? Also, are there any transfer transfer credits available? Um, I would encourage you to uh, check out our, our course list online on the curriculum page to see how much overlap there would be. For As far as the course credit transfer question, that's something that you would need to um, make a written request to the faculty director, and then she would decide if any of the courses you took were similar enough to, to take the place of a course that we currently have. You know, one question we get sometimes that uh, no one has asked in this specific session is, what does innovation mean in this context? Um, innovation is a little bit of a buzzword right now and means can mean a lot of different things in different contexts and different organizations. Um, so what this program means by innovation is recognizing the need for change in the healthcare system and identifying um, areas of, op of opportunity to, to improve things in the healthcare system. Um, and that's at all levels in the healthcare system. It could be, um, you know, for, for a nurse on the front lines or it could be somebody who's a higher up healthcare administrator. PJ Sindhu asks, uh, can you give us a sense of the instructors who are going to teach this program? Are they industry professionals, MDs, uh, UPenn professors? Sure. Um, our teaching faculty are all UPenn professors. Um, a lot of them are N MDs. 
Many of them are MD, PhDs, um, and it's a pretty mixed group. I would say most of them are from the Perlman School of Medicine, which is the, the school that administers the degree. But we do also have uh, faculty members from the Wharton School of Business, um, from Penn Nursing, um, the Dean of the Law School teaches an elective, uh, and we have faculty members from the Penn Medicine Center for Healthcare Innovation. Uh, Zeke Emanuel teaches the policy portion of the of the courses. Um, he's very involved, directly involved in policy at, at a national level. Um, Kevin Volpe teaches behavioral economics. He's a um, world-renowned expert in that area. And we also have Christian Turvich, who teaches healthcare operations. He's from Wharton, and um, as Zeke likes to say, literally wrote the textbook on healthcare operations. <laughs> Uh, Tawny Hammett asks, uh, "Is there a healthcare technology focus?" I can take that one if you if you if if you'd like. Uh, sure. In terms of in, in in terms of healthcare technology, uh, what's important in many of the classes in this program are the principles. One of the things that one of our faculty, uh, Roy Rosen, says is that technology is really important in improving healthcare and in innovating in a healthcare space. But technology comes second to being able to address a need, and that's really what's being taught here. Is 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 that key kernel of being able to address uh, to identify and address a need. Uh, P. J. Sindhu asks, "What is the emphasis? Clinical, analytical, business, policy, technology, etc." The focus is a bit of a mix. I would say less so on technology. Um, there is some clinical focus. There's definitely policy focus, um, and the other main areas of focus I would say are behavioral economics, um, innovation methodologies. Um, and evaluation methods for, for programs and policies. Anything else you can think of, Adam, that I'm yeah, forgetting at the uh, moment? What I would say is that we have, we have clinicians and administrators and policy people all in the program right now and who've taken these courses right now and have gotten a lot out of them. So I think that um, uh, the important thing in, in, in all of this is the interdisciplinary nature of it. So it's 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 about how do these different moving pieces of the healthcare system fit together. All right. Well, it sounds like um, everyone has asked their questions for today. I want to thank everybody so much for, for taking some time out of your afternoon to learn about the program. And please stay in touch with any questions. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday.